the loving hearts of all the scattered friends in the west were melting when they heard reports of the barbaric atrocities being inflicted upon the bahais in the homeland of bahaula the western friends passionately desired to do something to end these interminable persecutions it happened in 1902 that when Lua Getzinger was in Paris with her husband, the Shah had come to Europe to learn firsthand of the material and political progress of the West, about which he had heard fabulous stories and descriptions. Hedged in by his staff, his servants and his guards, he was inaccessible to any but those who interested him. His life in Paris was a busy one, of extensive visits throughout the city into shops public places theaters gardens and government institutions naturally the french press avidly reported the activities of this middle eastern potentate who was surprisingly enlightened tender hearted and a generous member of an historical rapacious dynasty reading praying and meditating on what she might do on behalf of the faith lua gets singer spontaneously decided to seek an audience with the shah to make him aware that the bahai faith had followers in the west and that they longed to see their brothers and sisters in persia also enjoying liberty of conscience and freedom of worship relieved from being continuous targets of inhuman treatment and undeserved cruelties it was difficult to obtain an audience with the king but lua's determination would not allow her to concede first she sought an audience through the persian representative in paris then she met with the shah's chief minister atabak azam during her attempt to see the shah which seemed an impossible task Lua constantly remembered the promise given to her by Abdul Baha who assured her that one day he would send her to the Shah of Persia. Lua was a gentle woman of the West with great beauty and excellent manners and breeding. Eventually she was confirmed in securing an appointment to offer dramatic and tragic appeal to his majesty the Shahanshah. Muzaffar Shah was surely intrigued by this beautiful woman in an elegant black dress tailored specially for this historic occasion. Lua was given full scope to express her feelings and describe how pitilessly the Bahais were being treated in Persia. She said, "Our souls tremble, our minds are agitated, and our hearts burn and break." her irresistible charm and remarkable gifts with the great and added charm of the spirit so impressed the king so won his respect for her courage that he gave his promise seconded by his chief minister that he would ameliorate the suffering of the bahais be at ease was the shah's promise as he dismissed her be at ease everything will be taken care of the king returned to persia to later become the monarch to sign the first constitution of his land earning for him the designation the just and bringing hope to all his subjects that they too might soon have those broad freedoms so hard won throughout the world it happened in 1905 that a very well known and learned man from the jewish community of hamadan haji mirza arjumand embraced the faith of bahaula inspired by the word of god he was articulate and full of his convictions and began to propagate the cause amongst both the jews and muslims this proved to be a terrible blow to the prestige of the ecclesiastical leaders of both religions This new convert was well versed in the Quran as well as the Old and New Testaments and this seemed incredible to the Muslims a Jew proving to us the advent of our own promised one was the lamentable cry of every adherent of the Islamic religion in that region 
So the Jewish and the Muslim ulamas lodged a grave complaint against the new intruder. The governor, venal and corrupt, saw in the vindictiveness of the Jews and Muslims an opportunity to extort large sums of money from the defenseless Baha'is. He used the charges as a basis for their arrest. The governor's agents immediately seized Hazi Mehdi Arjumand and several other outstanding believers and carried them to the seat of the governor where they were cast into prison, chained and detained without recourse to the courts. He then demanded large sums of money for their release. The Baha'is in Hamadan, encouraged by the reports of the king's willingness to intervene in such cases by his reputation for justice, cabled the Shah to protest the falsity of the charges and the extortion by the governor. To their great joy and satisfaction, the king immediately ordered the governor to free the prisoners and to see to their well-being. Alarmed at this royal intervention, the governor hastened to release the Baha'is and to make such restitution as would quell any possible retribution from the court. The other incident took place in Tehran and the account is as follows. It was considered an act of worship to be observed diligently by good Muslims to visit the graves of the Imams or those considered to be saints. They provided welcome open spaces in the crowded and congested cities of the East. The people gathered not only to visit the resting place of the dead, but to meet the living as well, to receive and exchange news, to mourn those passed away and to listen to religious songs and sermons. Sometimes they even came to watch the performances of jugglers and dervishes who played with snakes and performed acts of hypnosis. These gatherings typically occurred on holy days and usually every week on Thursday afternoon. A well-known cemetery in Tehran's eastern gate called Sar Qabr Aqa attracted many persons on these occasions. Baha'is of this particular quarter were renowned for their numbers, successful teaching activities and their audacity. When one of the Baha'is died and was buried in the public cemetery, the local mullahs seized upon this to incite the mule drivers who immediately hung the dead bodies of dogs around the grave and marched in the streets and lanes, attracting a following, shouting and cursing the hapless Baha'is. No human focus for their anger materialized and the mob dispersed without a victim. By happenstance, another Baha'i died soon thereafter and his body was also interred in the same cemetery. The second burial ignited the full fury of the Muslims who declared the burial of the Baha'i infidels to be an act of presumptuous desecration of the precincts of the holy tombs. Taking advantage of the excitability of the idle holiday throngs, the mullahs whipped up the expectant people with their tirades. One by one, the mullahs stood atop a mound and shouted at the top of their voices, Attack the Babi houses and shops, confiscate and plunder, do not purchase anything from them, prevent their filling their jars with water from the public reservoirs. Since the commands came from the priests, the ignorant mob accepted these words as coming from heaven to the mouth of the mullahs. Besides, it pleased their appetite for violence and plunder to hear the assurance given to them by their religious leaders that their ignominious deeds would be pleasing to God. What could the defenseless Baha'is do except to protect themselves by keeping aloof and in the silence of the hours of suffering pray to God? Baha'i shops were closed. The Baha'i men and their families sequestered themselves in their homes knowing that to emerge meant to be sent upon and murdered. The humble stores of provisions kept in their homes were quickly consumed. Night after night, a local reign of terror against the Baha'is continued. The Muslim terrorists prowled about with guns, swords and knives, seeking their quarry. The fate of the Baha'is wavered on the sword edge of chance. Ultimately, 
hunger and need would flush them from the retreats a few women living in one house anticipating the inevitable violence and possible death of all the bahais met together and after prayerful consultation decided to appeal directly to the shah they agreed upon a day for the concerted action and by going from roof to roof asked all the bahai women of sar kabra aka to leave their houses at the specific hour they decided to go first to the mansion of the grand wazir the chief minister atabak then on to the court of the shah himself on the morning set for the appeal the bahai women came forth from their houses dressed in their customary black garb fearful but determined they walked down the lanes and streets of the quarter first to the gate by which the king usually left the capital city on his hunting expeditions when they learned that the shah would not go hunting that day they turned to the house of the grand wazir they walked slowly through the narrow streets news of their coming and mission spread throughout the quarter the volatile tehranis came running to the spot stones flew the women were greeted with every insult and epithet some fell and were maltreated a few were beaten to death but the urgency of their mission drove them onward through the sea of opponents like a black stream they meandered through the narrow streets of tehran until at last they reached the great house of atabak they were quickly admitted to the large outside courtyard the biruni extensive enough to swallow the entire procession of women and boys but small enough to exclude the throng of tormentors informed of their coming the minister sent for the court photographer to record their presence and number after reading the written appeal for protection and justice he advised the women to proceed immediately to the shah's court there to plead directly with the monarch for intervention further incited by the rumors of their favorable audience with atabak the mob redoubled its harassment of the women as they proceeded to the gates of the king's palace it must be remembered that such appeals were dangerously too edged the absolute power of the shah was exercised unpredictably a man could lose his life as easily as he could gain justice when kind hearted muzaffar shah learned about their complaints and their supplication for relief from harassment and peril from damage to property and the threats of injury and death he immediately sent 50 armed cavalry men and 10 farashes from his private guard to disperse the mob further they were ordered to protect the bahais and to remain in sar kabra aka district until peace and quiet had been completely reestablished and so it was done the hand of the king was extended over the hapless bahais shielding them from the mullahs and muleteers alike when the master received news of the great courage of these bahai women in that glorious episode of the faith he promptly dispatched a very eloquent letter to them in it he said they quaffed the brimful cup may it be all to their health furthermore he assured them that the sufferings insults and iniquities sustained in the path of the lord were the signs of god's special mercies and bounties and indicated the coming of the day wherein all would be changed into praise and grace he said they were candles burning in the gatherings of women and stars shining from the horizon of eternity could it be that the king when confronted with those incidents remembered the graceful black clad western woman in paris and recalled his promise be at ease everything will be taken care of thank you for watching this video if you liked it please like and subscribe